sisters in Christ. Yeah. Are you okay on that? Yeah. That we're each brothers and sisters with our Father in Heaven and our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? Isn't that fantastic? That's really good. Sometimes these simple things pass us by. That God isn't a dictator, but He's our Heavenly Father. And we're brothers and sisters together. So, that leads me to my first uh, PowerPoint slide, if you could stick it up, Mark. Now, there's two sisters. Who can tell me who is their brother? Me. You. <laughs> you. Me, yes. <laughs> That's my elder sister, Eileen, and my younger Sister Helen, so we're sort of DNA joined, yeah? But you know, as Christians, we are joined together in the blood of Christ. One of the reasons we take communion from one chalice, we're joined together under the blood of Christ. Isn't that lovely? Come on, get enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just stand together. And we're going to share together in the prayer of humble access. Our prayer, prayer for purity, purity, I'm sorry. Take a moment. Father God, we come to meet with you. And also with each other. <clears throat> that we are one in the Spirit, one in the Lord. So help us, Lord, to prepare ourselves to meet with you in a special way today. Yes. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom the secret side of you, the secret side of you the thoughts of our hearts, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to sing together two worship songs, Come People of the Risen King, followed by Everybody Needs Compassion. We can sing, of course, but we have to murmur behind our masks slightly. <laughs> But the words get you, don't they? Thank you. 
to share the peace, but obviously we can't shake hands or hug or anything like that. But we can acknowledge each other, can't we? And, and really mean it because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Could you put that pattern at the moment? Well, there we are. Our theme this morning is following Jesus. And Jesus said, let's say it together. Jesus said, whoever is and sister and The peace of the Lord be always with you. And the Lord will be with you. Let's share a sign of peace as best we can with the people around us. Lord's peace. Lord's peace. That's nice. Peace that's lovely. Let's uh, sit or kneel as Christine comes to bring our um, intercessions and confession. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is a joy to come together and to be able to share together. So let us pray. Lord and Saviour of all, we praise you that you have called us your children, your friends, your people, and that you've brought us into the family of the church. You've promised to be with us wherever we are, whatever we may face. But we come before you now mindful that we are often forgetful of your presence and slow to follow the example of Jesus in our actions, in our words, and in our relationships with each other. We can often be narrow in our vision and feeble in our faith. And Lord, we just want to say sorry. Lord, we acknowledge all that we are and we just want to say sorry. So let's join together now in our confession. Just take a moment to look at the words. They, they seem very familiar to us. But let's just look at them again, remembering what it is we're actually saying to Jesus. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have, we have sinned, sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. So now may every part of our lives reflect your grace and proclaim your goodness for our Saviour's sake. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord, you've called us to share Christian fellowship with each other in this place where we find ourselves. We ask that our fellowship will be real and deep and meaningful. Lord, help us to nurture unity among us. For that, Lord, is your will. It's the will of Christ for his church. And as we look to the future, and hopefully a future free from COVID restrictions, help us to reach out once more into this community, to rebuild trust, and to see your power at work in people's lives. I'd like to pray, especially this morning, for food for all. 
which has stood like a beacon in this community. Um, and we just pray for the continuation of the vision that brought Food for All into being. We just think of the many who have been in there and, and received uh, love and welcome and just being able to share problems and, and, and just acknowledge that they need more than what they have. Lord, it has indeed been a place where people have been fed. Lord, in all we do, may you go before us, showing the way. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We are praying. And so we think of the world in which we live. And especially at this time, we remember the G7 meeting of world leaders. We pray for the discussions that they have and the decisions that they come to make. And we pray they will make a real difference to the lives of people and the world in which we live now and more importantly for future generations. May they bring hope to those who have no voice, who have decisions made for them. Lord, this morning we bring the pain of this world to you. For in so many ways, in so many places, we feel powerless in the light of so much distress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <laughs> Let's this morning remember the young people as they're growing up in this uncertain world. Lord, we put their future into your hands. And we pray, Lord, that you would make yourself known to them <coughs> so they may find meaning and purpose for their lives. You may have young people in your family or young people that you know. Young people dear to you. And silently now, I'd like to ask you to just lift them up to the Lord or speak out their names as we remember them. Natalie. Pray for a blessing on Colin to see if he recovers. We pray too for the children that come amongst us and worship with us. Lord, we pray that there might be many who will follow in their footsteps, that we will be overjoyed by the presence of the young amongst us. Protect them all, Lord, and keep them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, let's pray for our own families and friends. We pray especially for those who need help at this time, a comforting word, those missing the closeness of loved ones, those who feel alone and fearful. We remember those who are unwell, those sick in body, in mind and in spirit. Lord, comfort them, we pray. Lord, fill the moments of our life with gratitude for all that you've given us and help us when times are difficult. Loving God, we truly want to serve you better. By your grace, help us to walk more closely with you in the days ahead than we have in the days gone by. Merciful Father, accept these prayers, prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Christ. 
say to people, Derek is my name, yeah. Archdeacon is my role. <laughs> uh, so I'm definitely Derek. You don't have to call me Mr. Archdeacon or, or do any of those things. If you've watched the television series Rev, I don't have a black taxi parked outside either. <laughs> um, I'm not that sort of Archdeacon. <laughs> and and what, what do you do? What does an Archdeacon actually do? So Archdeacons do two things. I was sharing with Roger earlier on. Mostly about half of my time is spent on buildings. So you have to have a real love of our buildings um, because I, I represent the bishop in terms of faculty process, gutters, drain pipes, Ooh. churchyards. That's a big chunk of the job. And you've got to have that real sense of history and a love for our buildings. But our buildings are vehicles for mission. We're not the National Trust at prayer. So I'm always keen to explore how we use our buildings to further the mission of God, not preserve them in aspect. Because if you look at a building like this, it's changed over the centuries, and it will continue to change, God willing. And so that bit of my job is about buildings and rules and regulations and planning and all those exciting things that all of you will go to sleep about if I talk about for too much longer. <laughs> the other side of the job is about mission. Part of the job of Archdeacon is to encourage congregations to serve their communities. And some of you who've heard me before will know that I have three things I talk about. Generosity, hospitality, and a willingness to serve. And that's the heart of our mission for Jesus, to be hospitable and welcoming and open, to be generous. We're called to give ourselves away. And then to serve. And service, is about using the gifts that you've got in the way that God has given them to you for the benefit of each other and that wider community. So I mission is the other half of the job. I get a very strong sense that you, Derek, really love the Lord. You're not just a religious sort of person. You, you, you love the Lord. How, how did that happen? I mean, were, were you brought up in a Christian family or, or were you converted later in life? So, um, I wasn't brought up in a particularly Christian family. Uh, we didn't go to church on Sunday. Uh, I went to church schools, um, just because that was the nearest school, and we'd go on high days and holidays. In the, in the 1970s, you went. We had a half day on Ascension Day. I mean, tell that to the schools now, and they'll, they, they won't believe you. But we used to crawl off to the church in the town, and the vicar would get up in the pulpit, and we'd all go to sleep <laughs> um, as children. But um, uh, about the age of 17, um, I committed myself to Christ. And for the first time, someone sat down and explained to me about the gospel. And I was very fortunate, I didn't know it at the time, but it was a little old lady in her 
well, she seemed like she was in her 80s, she's probably about 50, I expect, by my age now, well, but she seemed very ancient to a 17 year old, actually, I think she was. And she worked with Gladys Aylward in China. And she was one of the mission partners who'd gone out to work with Gladys Aylward, and she talked about how Jesus had been with them through the trawl across China. And it just struck a chord with me. There was something about the way she spoke, something about the way she was, that she had something I didn't. And how did you actually do that commitment? Did you sit in prayer or did in prayer? Did you think about it or? So I talked to someone afterwards. I was interested but didn't really know what it was. Um, I jokingly say, I'm, I'm part of the Star Wars generation. I remember Star Wars the first time around. And I think I was probably at the stage as a 16, 17 year old as someone who thought God was an astronaut from outer space and it was all made up and a lot of nonsense. Heavily influenced by some of the writings of the late 60s and 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and thought it was all a bit of bunker. And I actually quite enjoyed baiting Christians at school and telling them that they were really following an alien from outer space. So actually it brought me up, bang, and it made me stop and think. Unbeknownst to me, at the same time my mother had become a Christian in a different meeting um, at the same time. And so we joined the Assemblies of God. My father didn't know any Christians, but he thought, well, if I was interested and my mum would become a Christian, we'd better find a church that was going to help us. Um, although he wasn't keen on coming himself. So we joined the Assemblies of God, and for two and a half years, I was a member of the Assemblies of God, and during that time, I finally committed myself to Christ. I was baptised in the public swimming pool. Amen. Um, in fact, I've been baptised as a baby. I didn't realise you weren't supposed to have yeah. done twice. I'm mean, a Christian, and you got baptised. This is in the Bible. So I've been baptised in the public in the local swimming pool with about 10 or 12 other people. And for two and a half years, very happily, part of the Assemblies of God. Derek, what... what what do you feel about the situation that we're in at Bromyard at the moment? Well, well, firstly, I want to say it's lovely to be with you again. I know I've preached with you before, um, and when I came two and a half, almost two and a half years ago with Brian Chave, just after Clive first was asked to step away, I really didn't believe we'd still be in the same situation yeah. this Absolutely. long afterwards. Mm -hmm. And while obviously I'm not allowed to talk about what's going on, we do need to pray this process moves more swiftly. Um, you'll know if you've read the press or listen even to the national news, mm. the Church of England has recognised this process is too slow. For us to be almost two and a half years later and still here, with you waiting, is just unacceptable. And the Church of England in July, really pray in July, the Church of England General Synod, in its final meeting of this mm. synod, is going to debate changes to the process which deals with these sort of issues. Excellent. And I think that's really good news. But I want you to know, I, my heart is for you. I love coming here. I hope you've seen that when I've been. And um, Keena's just asked me if I would come once a month for the next few months. And I'm going to do that just to support you and be here. Some of you might want to run screaming the other way and think, I've really got my black taxi outside. But my job is to support you. And one of the real sadnesses for me until a month ago, I didn't have a colleague who was a fellow Archdeacon, mm. which meant until Fiona was appointed as Archdeacon of Ludlow to replace Bishop Alistair, that I didn't have someone I could share these things with so that I would be able to support you and Fiona would be able to do discipline. And what we've agreed is to support one another in that way, so if there's a problem in her Archdeaconry, I will deal with it so she can offer pastoral support. And in the future, if it happens in this archdeaconry, she'll do it and I can offer pastoral support. Because it seems to me that at the point you most needed support, we had to say, you couldn't talk to me, you couldn't talk to the bishop, yes. yeah. and you were left high and dry. And so, no, dis no disrespect to Bishop Alistair, he was a bishop. He wasn't, uh, he was a bishop, he was also an archdeacon, but he didn't. He had a role in the process. And I think it's really good and some people are disappointed that we don't have another bishop alongside Bishop Richard, but I think it's really good that you've got two archdeacons because it means we can support okay. churches. What, one last question, okay? Yes. Because I can see some of the young ladies out here <laughs> looking at you meaningfully and they're thinking, I wonder if that guy's married. Are you? 
One of the bad news for those young ladies is, yes, I am. I'm happily married to Claire. We've been married, I better get this right, didn't I? Because it's been recorded. Uh, 29 years this year, back in April. Um, and Claire and I met while I was at college. She did three years at college before I got there. Um, and then we got married while, when I met her at college. And uh, she supported me through my ministry in the church. And I've dragged her all around the country. So High Wycombe, Devon, Aylesbury, Tame, <laughs> Bristol, everywhere we've gone, Claire has happily towed along. I've said to her, when we retire, she ought to choose where we retire. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. That's, that's really helpful. Now, in a few moments, we'll be singing your hymn choice. Would you like to tell us what it is? But we'll have the reading yes. in between. So, would you like to tell us what your hymn choice so, is? We'll go straight from yes. the reading to the hymn. I've chosen to go with my sermon this morning, Will You Come and Follow Me? And it seems to me that our main calling in life is to follow Jesus. <coughs> it's so easy to follow other things, isn't it? You've only got to look in W. A. Smith's, for example, all the books about spirituality and all the different ways of life you can follow. Yeah. But actually, we know something really important as Christians. Absolutely. That Jesus is the heart and soul of our lives. And it's Jesus we're called to follow. Thank you very much indeed. Mary, would you like to come and share the reading, and then we'll go straight into Derek's hymn choice. For all the young ladies looking at me, I'm sorry, I'm married. So <laughs> <laughs> I should be so lucky. Um, well, our gospel reading is from Mark chapter 3, and we're looking at Jesus being accused by his family and by teachers of the law. Starting at verse 20. <sighs> then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting round him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle round him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. 
wristband with the letters WWJD on it. Can anyone remember what that stood for? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? That's right. They're not so popular now, they disappeared, but there was a phase, wasn't there? Everyone wore the different bands, there was Help for Heroes, there was Cancer Relief, and there was What Would Jesus Do? I think in today's Gospel reading, Jesus' family needed a reminder of who he was. When you listen to that gospel story, there's two things that struck me. Firstly, they're embarrassed by him, and they think he's gone mad, and so they set out to stop him preaching. Mark is very good. He's told us that Jesus has been baptised, and he started his ministry, and he started his ministry in his hometown. One of the first things he does recording the Gospels, he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth and preach a sermon, basically telling them that he's the Messiah. I find it really interesting that Jesus' family were trying to stop him, given his birth. If you think about it, Mary and Joseph have experienced angels, kings and shepherds all coming to visit Jesus at his birth. Mary was visited by an angel, and yet his actions are an embarrassment, and they want to shut him up. That's the first thing to draw your attention to this morning. Following Jesus might make you an embarrassment. 
It shouldn't worry us. Paul tells us that he's a fool for Christ elsewhere in the New Testament. Following Jesus is an embarrassment to the world around us. The world thinks the most important person in the room is you. And everything about our world, on the whole, points to that one thing. You are the most important thing. If you don't believe me, just sit and watch a set of adverts on the television. Or for those of you who read your Sunday newspapers, get the magazine supplement out, turn to the back, and you'll discover that most of the adverts are all about you. When I lived and worked in Bristol, at Bristol Cathedral, I used to have to drive in from where I lived, outside the city, into the city. And the buses, very often, had big adverts for plastic surgery. So that you could improve the you that you were to make you more attractive, less fat, thinner, wider, longer, whatever it is you wanted, <laughs> the bus promised you that you could be the you that you wanted to be. The advertisers know that the world is all about you. The gospel is all about everybody else. And the one thing, if you take nothing else away this morning, Jesus has called you to give yourself away. Salvation isn't just for our benefit. It's really easy, I think, sometimes to think that once we're saved, we can sit it out until God decides to wind up history and everything will be fine. Those of you who've done the Alpha course will know that Nicky Gumbel talks about this in one of the talks. But I just want to remind you this morning, we're called to gossip the gospel. I'm sure that every one of you has hobbies or interests that you could talk for hours about. It might be about a cricket team, a football team, it could be knitting. It doesn't matter what it is, you can talk about it for hours. Those of you who have got grandchildren, how many of you, particularly the ladies in your handbag, have got photographs of your grandchildren that you could show me if I asked you? Or on your phones now? But actually, we can all talk about the things that are important to us. Jesus talked about what was important to him, which was the kingdom of God. He wanted people to have the same relationship with Jesus, through Jesus, with his Father. Paul, writing later on in the New Testament, tells us the most important thing is to point to Jesus. John, in his Gospel, calls us to be signposts of the kingdom. So I scratch my head a little bit when I read in Mark that Jesus' family are embarrassed. They're embarrassed because he's talking about faith and he isn't a rabbi. They're embarrassed because he's talking about faith and he isn't a church leader. And we're told in the other Gospels the other reason they're embarrassed is because he speaks with authority and the church leaders didn't. Well, that's quite something, isn't it? The very people that were called to lead the people of God, the Jewish nation, weren't talking with authority. And Jesus spoke with authority. When Jesus calls us, he doesn't ask us to be eloquent or clever. He simply asks us to talk about why we follow him. That's why I chose the hymn. Will you come and follow me? Jesus calls us to be the person that God has created us to be. The person that God knows we can be. And our calling is to become more like Jesus. More like his son. That might cause us to be an embarrassment to our friends, our families, but it will never embarrass God. It's quite clear that the religious authorities didn't have much time for Jesus. He threatened their authority. Because if they didn't speak with authority and he did, then he showed them up. 
Mark and Matthew particularly are quite rude about the Pharisees and Sadducees. At one point, Matthew calls them whitewashed tombs, that they look good on the outside and are pretty rotten inside. <laughs> and so they begin to cook up a plan. Let's call him a devil worshipper. Let's tell the world, basically, that he's mad. We can write him off as a madman. Our faith will sometimes call us to speak out in ways that the world will think is mad. Our faith calls us to follow Jesus in a way that might, just might, cause offence to the values of our world. The world isn't bad, after all, God created it. If you go back to the book of Genesis, which we could have done this morning, in the creation story, it says everything that God created was good. And I think sometimes we try and set things up as God is good, world is bad. That's not actually what the Bible says. The Bible says that everything that God has created is good. Everything that God has created is good. It's not two equal and opposite forces having a ding-dong. This is God's world, we're God's people, and it's God's creation, but it's been spoiled. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when he was writing from prison, imprisoned by the Nazis, in fact, he wrote it at about the same time the D-Day invasion was happening. He said the problem is that the church has adopted cheap grace. Strange phrase. Theologians use strange language, so I'll translate it for, for us. Basically what he's saying is, there's too many people in the church who think it's all about them. We get saved, and then we're fine, thank you very much. Bonhoeffer said, but actually, when you follow Jesus, there's a cost to following. It calls us to step out in faith. It calls us to feed the hungry, look after the poor, to seek out the lost. Our faith is an outward-looking faith that seeks to help restore the world back to the way it was when God created it, to bring heaven down to earth. What a challenge. And I know you're really good here. Last time I came in person, Keena took me up to the food bank. What a brilliant example that's been during COVID when people have been uncertain about their lives to know that the church is leading the way and ensuring that people can have a meal on the table. That's a really good example of the church living out its faith. Some people will think we're mad. There'll be families in this town who've benefited from the generosity of those of you here. Living out our faith in the world, not just in this building. After all, I don't know about you, I spend probably less than, well, you know, that's probably untrue because I spend a lot of time looking at churches during the week. But in terms of worship, most of us only spend an hour or so in church on a Sunday, and the rest of our life is out there. Bonhoeffer knew that if the church was going to make a difference in the world, it had to stand up against tyrants like Hitler. It had to stand up for the values of the gospel wherever it found itself. It's interesting, it became known as the Confessing Church in Germany. The church that confessed Jesus Christ was Lord, not the government. Not in our case the Queen, although she's a great servant of God, and you've only got to listen to what she talks about, about her faith, to know where her faith sits. But actually, when we become Christians, we enter a different kingdom and follow a different king. We no longer follow the ways of the world, we follow the ways of Jesus. The other thing is, 
But Jesus reminds people and reminds us, and Wallace has done it brilliantly this morning with that picture of your sisters, Wallace, but you can choose your friends. We make that choice, don't we? We choose who to be friendly with. You can't change, choose your relatives. So if you look around the church this morning, and there are people you don't always get on with, they're just as much your relatives as the people you love. So remember that, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your relatives. So when you become a Christian, you have relatives all over the world. And it's amazing, isn't it? I've had the great privilege to go to a conference in the United States a couple of times and to sit with people from all over the world. And the one thing we have in common, even if language is difficult, is faith in Jesus Christ. And I've sat with people from Venezuela, from Argentina, from North America, from Canada, from the UK, from Africa, from Estonia and Latvia. And do you know what the one common word is we can all say together? Jesus. Jesus said, it's not your earthly family that ultimately is your first allegiance. Your first allegiance is to your heavenly family. Amen. Jesus calls us to love our neighbour. I've got a very good friend who was in my church when I grew up. I've lost touch with her, but she was a very good friend at the time, and she was a school teacher. And she was a Sikh by background. And I remember her saying rather sadly that when she became a Christian, her entire family disowned her. But she said it was the most important thing she'd ever done, was to choose to follow Jesus. Amen. And she gained a family far bigger and broader and wider than the one who rejected her. She didn't stop loving them. She longed to be reconciled with her parents and her brothers and sisters. But she recognised, in a way most of us will never have to, that following Jesus has a cost. And for some people in our world today, choosing to follow Jesus puts their life on the line. <coughs> Jesus needed to remind the people around him that following God was about joining the family of heaven, whether your earthly family went with you or not. The good news for those of you who have members of your family who don't yet know Jesus is that later on in the New Testament, Paul tells us that our faith rescues the faith of our spouses. What a wonderful picture that God gives us, that his love is so broad and deep and wide that our faith encompasses our families. If you look at the book of Acts, very often when people committed to Christ, the whole family is baptised. And so Jesus calls us to follow him. What a great joy and a great hope that we have. I don't know about you, but the most important thing I've ever done is choose to follow Jesus. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's really hard. But what I've learned is when Jesus walks with us, we're never alone. Amen. I'm going to finish with a story of someone I met in Devon. She sadly died now. She was in her 80s then, and that was over 18 years ago. She was the most godly person I've ever met. You just walked into her house and knew that Jesus was with her. And she would tell her her story of faith. And she said the most important thing she learned was no matter what happened to her, she hung on to Jesus. And that's really the challenge this morning. As we approach a new week, is to ask yourself, what would Jesus do? When you're faced with decisions, when you're faced with that choice between following your own desires and doing stuff for yourself, or giving yourself away, ask yourself, what would Jesus do? 
our lives, our signposts to another kingdom and to another king. They're signposts to King Jesus. What a glorious saviour that we find. That he calls us to follow in his footsteps and to do the things he did. Amen. Amen. Let's respond with Derek and uh, follow the words of the Creed, which will be on the screen. Shall we stand, if you don't, if you can? It sort of fits in, Derek, with what you're saying. Do you believe and trust in God, the Father, source of all being, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in Him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son? who took our human nature, died for us, and rose again. We, we believe, believe and trust, trust in him. him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known to the world? We, we believe and trust in him. him. This, this is the faith of the church. church. This, this is our faith. faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May God strengthen this faith within us. From heaven you came, help us bear.
For everything on heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord is here. He is here. He is here. Lift up your hearts. We we give hearts to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right to give thanks and praise. praise. You may wish to sit or kneel. Let us give thanks to God, to the Lord. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You have raised us as your children, and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shed our life, that we might live in him, and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross, and made for all the perfect sacrifice of sin. On the night that Jesus was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, Father, send the Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us here this morning the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you, Lord, this sacrifice of praise. Holy, 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 my heart, my heart adores you. My heart is glad to say the words, you are the Holy Lord. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Archdeacon Chesney will come and bring the wine to the people on that side, and I will, t sorry, the bread to the people on that side, and I will take the bread to the people on, on, on that side. And uh, I'm afraid we're still in a position where it's, it's only myself who takes the wine on, on behalf of us all. I'm sure that will change in due course. So do please be seated and be very careful. And if you feel it's a bit too much for you to receive the, the bread in, in these difficult days, then just indicate that to myself or Derek, and we can offer a little prayer for you.
will share together in the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the name you of our souls and bodies to the healing of the sacrifice. Send us out from the power of your Spirit to live in the Welcome Roger to the front just to give a couple of short notices. Roger, could you do that, please? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It should perhaps have been said at the beginning, but just a couple of quick things. First of all, we've all benefited very much from the ministry of Derek and Wallace and the musicians and everything this morning, but don't forget there's an important part of ministry as well, and that is uh, as sides, sides men, sides ladies, stewards, call them what you may, to look after and welcome people into this church, uh, to, uh, to make sure you know who they are, and, and as the first people, people meet in this building. And so um, Mark and I will be trying to compile a list, an up-to-date list of people who can do those duties in the future. Um, it is a very important part to welcome people here. Um, we've got to give some training, obviously, regarding fire precautions and a little introduction to safeguarding will be necessary as well. But we very much would like people to share with us in that work. And can I also at the same time thank one or two like Jill who just stood in when I was dashing around up here sorting things out to make sure that the welcome was there this morning. So can I just ask you all for that? And the other thing I was going to say was very, just a personal thing. Thank you for your prayers about me when I was ill for a couple of months. And also when my wife Lynn was taken into hospital last weekend, as some of you know. Thankfully, they thought that she had a stroke, but it turned out at the end not to be. And uh, she now looks very much better. And I know a lot of you were praying, and thank you very much indeed. It does make a difference. Well, we've just this morning prayed a prayer of blessing over Lynn. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Father, that it has turned out not to be a stroke. And we just pray for, I don't know, the future. We pray a blessing on Roger and Lynn. Amen. 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 Well, we've got a, a super worship song, I think, anyway, as the final hymn this morning. Uh, Jesus put this song into my heart. And of course, it goes on to say, Jesus taught us how to be a family. Mm -hmm. So it's very apt. So we're going to stand up and enjoy this final worship song. Jesus put this song into our heart. Thank you. 
and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and yours this day, this week, and always. Amen. Amen. And now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of But on your way to your ministry in society, would you collect a cup of coffee or tea and then go forward outside where you can take your mask off and drink it? <laughs> Thank you.